because I like to talk about foods and stuff. Have uh, any of y'all ever farmed strawberries? Saw the light. Feel like a French fry. All right. When you grow a strawberry, you plant your strawberries and stuff just starts sprouting out and growing. And last time I seen a strawberry patch, it had lots of strawberries, different shapes and different colors, some of them were light, some of them were dark. Um, they were a lot of weeds growing up in it. What you got to understand is that when people farm strawberries, they take a, a really good looking strawberry and they kind of clone that plant. They, they only breed that particular plant so that all the strawberries are uniform and they look alike. What they will do is they will fumigate the ground to get rid of everything in the ground that's growing except for strawberries. And then they'll cover the ground with black plastic to keep other weeds and stuff from growing. Keeps the moisture in the ground and keeps everything perfect. Keeps the moisture level, the pH level, everything is balanced and perfect so that they can have consistent strawberries. Every one of them are alike. And upon maturation, They'll pick those strawberries and they will consistently taste the same. So it starts off with a good seed, a good batch, and they grow and they grow and they grow, and they are always the same. Sometimes you will notice that strawberries from the pig taste different from the strawberries at Walmart. Sometimes the tomatoes taste different. Um, sometimes uh, y'all notice Walmart tomatoes are a a very pinky color sometimes, like in the winter time. And just because it says farm fresh, that does not mean the farm's down the road. Sometimes the farm is in Chile or uh, you know Peru or other places around the world. And they ship them in on buses and airplanes, not buses, but uh, um, you know, ships and stuff. And um, by the time they get to you, they probably started out as like green tomatoes. And because, uh, I mean, how many times you've seen ripe bananas at a grocery store? They're either all green or they're all ready to eat right then. They got black stuff all over them. Where's like the normal yellow bananas? You know, where do they go? And you know, you can't eat them till they turn dark. And they're best when the bananas turn solid black. I'm talking about mushy. That is when they are the sweetest. You're going to make banana bread, you've got to put an old black banana in it. Don't be putting no green banana, bananas in the banana bread because it's going to taste like banana bread. It's going to taste like green banana bread. All right? I'm just telling you how it is. All these different things come from different plant sources. Sometimes the Piggly Wiggly plants are good. Sometimes they ain't. Sometimes the Walmart produce is good. Sometimes it ain't. I like to get the produce from various places. They have good tomatoes. At a little stand up on 21, Terry Culver, he gets some pretty good tomatoes if there's a place to pull off there. Um, you can usually get a few tomatoes for a few bucks, and, and they're pretty good tomatoes. Um, you go to get you some plants. They got heirloom. They got big boys. They got like beefsteak, all kinds of different tomatoes, and they come in different shapes and sizes because they're different strains, but they're all tomatoes. I like to think that we we are all pretty good, but we're all different. In our relationship with God, sometimes we focus more on deficiencies or what we think are deficiencies instead of what the good parts are. Okay? I do know this. If I want a tomato sandwich, and I do not have a tomato, I cannot have a tomato sandwich. Whether it is a pink tomato, a green tomato, a ripe tomato, 
very ripe tomato. I cannot have a tomato sandwich without a tomato. Show of hands, have any of y'all ever made a tomato sandwich with canned tomatoes? You hadn't? You've never been hard up for a tomato sandwich. Then. If I got bacon and I want to put some tomato on it, and all I got is a can of tomatoes, I'm opening that can of tomatoes. I don't care if it's crushed, stewed, whole, whatever. It's a tomato. I'm not putting ketchup on it, but it's a tomato. That's better than no tomato, because then it's a bacon sandwich. Okay? I'm just telling y'all how it is. Sometimes we, uh, you know, we're a little too snooty about our tomatoes. To be honest with you, what if that's the only way you could ever have tomatoes at the can? It's the only way you can have a Coke? Mm-mm, a bottle. You don't go pick a Coke, do you? Mm. Get it any way you can get it. But sometimes we get snooty with them. I've seen people throw away whole fruits, whole vegetables, just cause blemish. You know what you do with that blemish? You just cut it off. When I open my banana and it's got a big black spot on it, I judge the black spot. I'm like, is this burnt or is this just a bruise? Because I don't mind a bruise. Bruise is a little dark, but it's still sweet. I'll eat the bruise. But if it's burnt, like a black spot, like, yeah, we just cut that out. We go on with it. The whole thing ain't burnt just because it's got a flaw. Right? I mean, have you ever bit into an apple? and You didn't eat half of it, and then you notice there's a worm in there. Hmm? How many of y'all ever bit into an apple, and you notice there's a half a worm in it? Yeah. Like, where did the other half go? Oh, I got protein in this one. Did you throw the rest of it away? You're halfway there. Just keep going. You ever find a hair in your food and throw out the whole plate? It's just a hair. It, it might have been yours, somebody else's. The, the makeup of it's the same. It's hair. You know what I do? It depends on how good the food is. If I was eating it just because it was there, and it was time to eat, and I just needed sustenance, and I saw a hair, that would give me an excuse to just stop eating it because it's not good. But if it's good, I throw that hair out, and I just keep going. Now, if I see more than one, I'm like, something's up. Now, this is human hair. I have found like a cat hair in my I'm immediately over. It's wrapped in bacon. That's a cat hair. And I'm like, a cat has been way too close to this food. And I do not like cats. I do not want to eat a part of a cat. You know. That's just how it is. Or dog hair. I don't want to eat any animal hairs, really. But sometimes you probably are eating hairs. We had some sweet peas back a few years ago. And Luke found a grasshopper head in the sweet peas. It was round just like the sweet peas. They all go through the little holes and and uh, the grasshopper head went through. The body didn't make it. There it was. Protein. Luke said, is this a head? I said, yep. Have you eaten peas since? Nope. Because there could be grasshopper heads all in them, right? If you really, really wanted the food, if you really, really wanted to eat something, you would not be as hung up on the quality of the food. You would appreciate it for what it is. On survival shows, they will catch a mouse, a rat, a snail, anything that's alive that they can eat, they will cook the death out of it. And then eat it. Sometimes bones and all. Just, it's sad to see somebody gut a mouse, 
cook the thing, cook the hair off of it, because how do you skin a mouse? You know, just cook the hair off of it, and then when it's all crispy, one bite, head and all. It's because they have to have something to eat. They're not being picky. They can't afford to be picky. I don't have a fire, but I have a fish. Guess who's eating sushi? Going to eat it. I just killed a deer, but I don't have a fire. So we eating the tartar. Just eating raw deer. Eat it fresh. You're getting something in you because you don't care. You have to do it. Now, I know some of you are wondering, is he ever going to preach? Or is he just going to talk about food? And I realize I probably made some of you very hungry. No? What? Not with the worm and the raw deer? In our lives, chapter 1, in our lives we think so often, if I could get rid of this imperfection in my life, if I could get rid of this blimp, bruise, something like that, if I could just hide my faults, then maybe God would pick me. God would like me. Because sometimes we get to thinking that God don't like us. Like God is some picky person that's looking at our flaws and saying, you know what? I think I could do without this one. Or I think I'm going to throw this one away because it's got a blemish on it. We might would do that with fruits and vegetables, but God does not do that with human beings. Okay? As picky as we are, and as choosy as we are about certain things in our lives, we get like that spiritually speaking. But God does not. Sometimes we think about ourselves, if I wasn't so sinful, if I wasn't so clumsy, or impulsive, or loud, or quiet, if I was a little bit thinner, or maybe if I was a little bit taller, maybe if I had a little bit more money, maybe if I, I'd, I'd be a little more in better shape, I would be a better person. And if I was better then, maybe God would like me more. Maybe if I was gooder and more smarter. You see what I did there? Some of y'all was like, I don't see a problem with that. That sounded right. God likes you in spite of you. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were the black bananas, while we were the apple with the worm in it, while we were the the rotten tomato, Jesus still loved us. He died for us. But you don't think He likes you? Bless you. This like and love thing is weird. It has caused marriages to fail, friendships to fall apart, and all these things. I've heard people tell other people this. Oh, I love them, I just don't like them. I've told my kids this before. I love you, but right now I just don't like you that much. Keeping it real, being honest. And there's been times that they love me, but they don't like me. We have that with other people because we're human beings and we're flawed. We're brown bananas. God ain't like that. God does not look at us and say, you know, I loved you. I loved you so much that I die for you. But I just don't like you right now. God does not look at our imperfections and our flaws and the things that we think are insecurities and flaws. God doesn't look at that stuff and say, yeah, ooh, I just can't look at that. I don't like that. Sometimes we feel like, you know, God loves us, but He only likes the spiritual part of us or the good part. So if I want God to like me more, I gotta be be more holy. I gotta be more good. I gotta do more things right. I gotta get rid of all of these flaws in my life before God will like me. I know He loves me. He said He loved me. He showed me how much He loved me. But liking me, 
That's just not true. The book of John tells us that Jesus became flesh and lived among us. All right? He became a human being just like us. It says in verse 12, John 1 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or human or a husband's will, but born of God. And then it says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. Have you seen His glory? The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen Him. And y'all, sometimes we get to looking and measuring ourselves up to Jesus and we see all the flaws that we have in our life. And those flaws are not things that we work on. Instead, they become excuses for the reason why God can't possibly like us. And then what Satan is doing with us is turning those things into, I don't know, excuses or sometimes even crutches for the reason why we can't possibly be who God created us to be. You know, you're not the only one to ever look at pornography. You're not the only one to to ever commit adultery. You're not the only one to ever lose your temper. You ain't the only Christian to ever curse. You're not the only one that's ever stole something, took something that wasn't yours. You ain't the only one that ever got drunk, got stoned, got addicted. You ain't. A lot of people's gone through that. With the help of God, we've overcome that. But Jesus came down here and became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Now, from what I know about the life of Jesus Christ, in the Bible it clearly states that He who was without sin which was Jesus, died for our sin. So He came down here and lived like us with the same temptations as us, the same kind of opportunities to mess up as us, and yet He never did. He showed us that it was possible, it was possible to live a sinless life. Now, I think a lot of times we don't try because we don't think it's possible. And what winds up happening is that we accept our flaws as uniqueness and God made us this way. Like we're blaming God for for our shortcoming. You might not be the smartest one in the room and God might have made you that way, but don't be blaming your sinful choices on God. If you don't think God likes you, you got to ask yourself something. Am I feeling that way because of a sin in my life? Or because of an insecurity? If you feel like you have a deficiency in some kind of way, and God made you that way, because He made us all different. We ain't all the same strawberry, folks. God made us in all kinds of flavors. All kinds of looks, all kinds of shapes, all kinds of intellect all kind of unintellects, everybody working together for God's purpose and God's reason. you got to come to grips with God made you how He made you. Okay? But He didn't create you with sin. You added that to the recipe. You was just tomato in a bowl. And now you done turned your life into a salsa. You done throwed some old nasty onions in there and a jalapeno and this, that, and the other, and it's like, ooh, this ain't what it used to be. Yeah, it used to be a nice tomato, and you earn it. Now it's salsa. Well, I would like to spice my life up. I'll put a little cayenne in there. Spice it up. Now can't nobody enjoy you. Because you earn. You've earned your life. Like, nobody, nobody could ever like me now. 
I'm just too far gone. I'm too far gone. You know what he does with that salsa that's just inedible? The only way you can fix it? You take that little bowl of salsa. It used to be just you. That one lovely tomato. And you started mixing a bunch of ingredients into your life. And you made a mess of it. But God will take you and put you with a bunch of other tomatoes and fix you. It's like pouring salsa into a big old pot of other tomatoes. And now we can all work together and be delicious. But the problem is, and I think this is where the Mexicans started making mole. That is a sauce that has like 30 ingredients in it. There was like eight families that all had a different sauce. And they were all nasty. Alright? Sonny, you was the sauce. You were fine as a tomato. But you decided to spice things up. So now you're nasty. Alright? Somebody else over here, some, they done dropped some chocolate in. One of them's just a chili sauce. They said the other. One of them even put a loaf of bread in there. I'm going to make mine thick. You know what they did? They all got together. Something kind of like a church. Brought all the sauces together. It's like, look, by myself, I am no good. But together we can be great. So they dumped it all in the same pot and they called it mole. Now, that is one of the most expensive and difficult. It takes three to five days to make. Because you've got to roast everything and, and, and puree it and let it sit. And the, the flavors marry got chocolate in it, it's got nuts in it, it's got chilies, and, and it's got stale bread and all this kind of stuff. And it comes out this velvety, dark, delicious sauce. I mean, you taste, you taste some bitter chocolate, you taste cinnamon, you got, you got heat, you got sweet, all these different things. You're like, wow, this is a complex bunch of deliciousness. Yeah, you used to just be a tomato, but then you messed it up. But then when you got together with others, now you're like a masterpiece. That's what God's wanting to do with us. It's like a church. We were all messed up by ourselves. And we did it. It was like, nobody's going to like me now. But God took you and mixed you up with some other ingredients. It straightened you out. Now you've got encouragement. You've got love. You've got, you got friendship. You got understanding, you got compassion, and all these other things that can make the recipe good again. If you want to stay by yourself and just be a little lonely bowl of nasty salsa, you can. That's what a lot of people are choosing to do. But there is a better way. Jesus came down here and he experienced every aspect of life. He was around a bunch of nasty people. He hung out with the nastiest of people. People that were severely flawed. He would go from town to town and eat supper and spend the night with the worst people. The most flawed people. I'm talking about the black bananas of people. That's who He went to. Jesus didn't go stay with the pretty lovely yellow bananas with just a few little specks on it. It's just right. He didn't stay with a lovely red plum tomato or heirloom tomato. We've got purple ones now. I've never had one of those. I'd like a purple tomato sandwich. You know what it tastes like? Tomato. Just a different color. And if it ruins, you know what it tastes like? Rock tomato. You think you something. You ain't. You're just a tomato. But you're purple. I've been telling my kids for years, Barney ain't none. When Jesus came to earth as a baby, He was lavished with presents. He had frankincense, myrrh, gold. And it looked like He was going to be a lot different from most of us. Treated as a king. But before he was two years old, Jesus' mom and daddy 
fled the country, probably had to sell all that stuff in order to get passage into Egypt so that they could hide from the Herod who was trying to have them killed, trying to kill all the babies under two years old because he didn't want to be usurped as king. Because the wise men said, we've come to worship the king that's born in the town of Bethlehem. And he's like, yeah, tell me where he's at. I'd like to worship him too. Wink, wink. And they were like, okay. So they went and saw him and they like, let's take another route. We don't want to go back by Herod's house. He's a little crazy. The angel told Joseph, like, you need to go to Egypt and hide. Herod's after you. So they went. When they finally got the coast is clear, because they've been using that for a long time, they went back to Nazareth. While in Nazareth, Joseph's hometown, Joseph did what he, he knew how to do. He was a carpenter. They were not rich. They didn't have a fancy house. They didn't have the nicest donkey. All right? They couldn't afford a camel. You know, there was a very meager life that he lived. When Jesus became an adult and he went into his ministry, he didn't own a house. He didn't have possessions. He just spent the night with folks, traveled around, just doing what he came here to do. And that's to let people know that he loved them. And by the way, I do like you too. I saw a midget in a tree one day. He said, I would like to go home and spend the night with you. Mm hmm. And he was like, well, let's go. Come on. And the whole house got saved. There was this woman who had very loose morals, living in a town that no Jew would go into. He went in there and talked to her. And he was like, woman, I would love to talk to your husband. Go get him. She was like, uh... I'm living with a guy right now, but he's not my husband. Jesus is like, oh yeah, I know. You've already had several husbands, and you're shacking up right now. I'm trying to help you. Despite all of that, I still want you. I want to help you. She went back to town all saved, and, and the whole town had revival, and salvation broke out and everything. Because when it comes to your flaws, Jesus came here to help you with that. Okay? So instead of looking at it like, God can't possibly like me. I'm too messed up. God wants to help you. He wants to like you. He wants to have some time with you. You feel betrayed, abandoned, things like that? Jesus did too. How many times was Jesus abandoned? Were people betraying Him? How many times did He have people turn their backs on Him? Even His closest friends. It happened so often. But you know, the thing about Jesus is that even though all that stuff happened, He kept going. He knew what it was like to have friends and then have them leave. He knew the joy of all that. He knew what betrayal was. Everything that we go through in life that Satan tries to throw at us, Jesus kind of knows what it feels like. He was loved by his family, and some of them turned crazy on him. You got any crazy family? It might try to keep you from going to Disney World hmm? because of the virus in China. Her mama? Yeah. Hey, Ma. Just quit. Like B.B. Rex has said, if it's going to be, it'll be. Maybe it was meant to be. So just ride with it. The point is, Jesus knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like. And as much as you say to yourself, I don't want to be me because I've got flaws, how could Jesus like me? I don't like me. As much as you say that, you need to understand this. Jesus is wanting to tell you, I love you so much 
that I came to earth to be like you. He came down here to be a human being just like us. So he could experience things just like us. So he would know what it feels like. Just like us. You're never alone. You don't have to go through things alone. And are you different? Is it a deficiency? Or is it just unique? God might have made you in a unique way for a unique purpose that nobody else could do. Don't think that God don't like you. He loves you. And He made you the way you are because God likes things special. Wouldn't it be sad and kind of boring if God made us all alike? You know? Why do we get hung up on that? That's, that's the way it should be. Everybody wants to be the same, be alike, have this standard of life that we try to live up to. You know, there was a man back many decades ago that was trying to turn the world into being just alike. His name was Hitler. And if you was talking about Hitler, you'd be like, oh, no, we don't, we don't like him. We wouldn't want to be like him, but... At the same time, a lot of people have it in their mind. I can't be happy unless I'm like everybody else. God didn't make you that way. He likes you just like you are. Bless you. Now, as we close, I just want you to think about this in your heart. All right, you ready? Do you like yourself? God likes you. But the reason we don't feel liked sometimes is because we don't like something about ourselves. Spiritual maturity is getting to the point where you realize the uniqueness that God created you with is something to be celebrated, not something to be whined about. Not something to be just sad about all the time. You should be excited about it. God made you a certain way. He made you exactly how you're supposed to be. So, if you are exactly how you're supposed to be, Almighty Creator made you that way, celebrate it. Maybe you're not supposed to be tall. Every time you had to get something out from under the counter, you'd be thankful that you're not seven feet tall. Hmm? Or if you are tall, every time you get to get something off the top counter, be thankful you're tall. Don't ever be reaching up under them. Oh, I wish I was short. Hmm. And all the short people, I wish I was tall. People with blonde hair, wish that they was brunette or redhead and people dyeing their hair different colors and I just can't be satisfied with who I am. I want to be something different. I don't like things the way they are. One of the saddest days I remember from my childhood was when baby from Dirty Dancing got a new nose. She didn't look the same anymore. I was like you ruined it. She's not the same. Michael Jackson got his cut off. He didn't like it. Given the chance, is there something about you that you want to change? Did God make it that way? Or is there something about your life that you can change because you made it that way? If there's something going on in your life that you decided to add to your life, you're not like a creation chef. Maybe you need to just dump that ingredient out and start over today. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, you can do that. Grace makes it where you can start over. Jesus made it. 
you need to pray about something today, I pray that the Holy Spirit has laid it on your heart to do so. Actually, let's pray about it right now. Father, I ask You now that if there's anything in our life that we change, that we would reach to You for the power and the courage and the ability to make that change. And Father, if there's something about us that we don't like, Pray that You would help us come to grips with it and to celebrate the fact that You made us exactly how You want us to be. God, I thank You for making us how You want us to be. You love us and I thank You for that. Father, if there's anyone here that has not accepted Your love, pray that they would today. God, I know You love us. And I know You like us just how we are. So, Father God, please give us the courage today to change the things we need to and to celebrate the things that are how they're supposed to be. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll sing the invitation of hymn.